road trip with the family. This weekend? This weekend. And I had a dream that when I came back, it was like The Walking Dead and zombies and stuff like that. So originally I thought this was all overblown, but what do you think? Like, I think what we should do today is separate fact from fiction. All right. And break it down so people out there and listeners feel empowered. Uh, they should never uh, be paralyzed with fear, right? So we always say, run fast, don't run scared. Right. But then don't be overly cautious and think, uh, at the same time, don't be overly free and think there's no, no need to do anything. I right. think there's a happy medium in between both, which if most people understand some of the basics of this and then go into like how it's spread and we can talk about a whole host of things, I think people always feel better uh, when they have some knowledge, right? It's the right. fear of the unknown. So well, I think today we're going to be a little more serious than usual. We'll switch it up a little bit since switch gears. you're actually the expert in this. So this is a... So I have the glasses. That's how people know that look this, sharp. Is, this is a more serious conversation, but so I'm this, glad to do it. Yeah, so yeah. this is the special coronavirus edition of Recommended Daily Dose. I am Dr. Clinton Coleman, along with the Chief of Infectious Disease at Holy Name Hospital, Dr. Suraj Sugar. What's up? How are you? So... Um, I just want to give you some stats. So, you know, as of as of today in the U.S., I yeah. think there were a total of 164 cases. Well, well that, by the time I look this up, right. it may, by the time this comes out, so perfect. When you say cases, those are diagnosed cases. Right, right. And there's total deaths, but worldwide there were 109,000 and um, like 3,800 deaths. Right, right. What shocked me is when I heard what Italy had done. They quarantined, you know. A large proportion of their population essentially made the whole 16, country a red zone. Shut it six, down. Well, first start off with 16, 17 million in like Venice and Milan, but then most recently now the whole country is. Yeah, they started in the northern part of Italy, um, which is beautiful, by the way. You ever been there? No. When things calm down, I want you to go there. Okay. It's really beautiful. Been to Rome, but uh, great cheese. But this is something that I think we should talk about. And, so uh, my question to you is: right. Is this are we? Right to be paranoid? Is this overblown? Or so you know, what, I'll I used to think that, I'll, but now I don't think. No, it. I'll tell you. Perfect. Someone said, "Doc, it's not a time to panic," and I tell them very honestly, it's never a time to panic. We never, never panic. It doesn't right. make any sense. It doesn't right. help anyone. It doesn't help patients. It doesn't help doctors. It doesn't help public health system. Right. So let's take it down. Let's break it down one step at a time. So we're talking about COVID nineteen. Okay. So that's the coronavirus. That is the syndrome. Coronavirus identified two thousand nineteen. Okay. So it came out of uh, Wuhan city in Hubei province in China, okay. first described WHO on the end of December. So now, COVID-19. But the virus is called SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, COVID-2, Coronavirus 2. So okay. why is that? All right, so when people say coronavirus, it's been around since the 60s. Right. Seven different types of coronavirus affect humans. So first of all, where did it come from? Believe so, it or not, it actually came from bats. That's what, That was my question. So yeah. I, th I think... You know, part of it is reassuring, you know, separating fact from fiction, right? Yeah, reassuring I'm the public. It. So there's a lot of rumors. So the initial rumor was this was from bat soup or something like that. So I'm going to I'm gonna be the layperson and I'll throw out the rumor and you, you reassure us or tell us the, whether it's perfect, fact or fiction. Perfect, perfect. So where did, where did they say this comes from? So it's a zoonosis. So think zoo, animals. animals. This is okay. a, a virus that originated in animals as a host. So there's some bats out there that have, you know, runny noses, sniffly okay. noses. Okay. That's where this virus uh, originated. Now, that's the family coronavirus. We've seen over time they've jumped to humans. So that is the zoonosis part. It's a virus that affects humans, but originally came from animals. Now, okay. there's animal-to-animal -animal transmission. So there's got to be intermediate hosts. So we think about SARS back in 2003. Probably it went to, you know what civet cats are? No. Uh, apparently they're very, a delicacy in parts of okay. the world. Uh, so it jumped from bats to civet cats, animal-animal transmission, civet cats to humans, animal to human, and then human to human. 2015. So the was, transmission between animal and human is, is that? Well, I'll tell you, all, all like if I eat a, a, a that's the delicacy or is well, that's what surmise. First of all, you get a lot of these happen these. when you have animals in duress, um, in close contact with each other. So okay. think the wet markets of East Asia. Sure. So you're going to have a lot of animals that maybe don't normally uh, ever get together okay. in such close proximity in nature. They're under duress. They might not be the healthiest animals, right? They're waiting to be slaughtered right. or eaten. So then you very easy, and then you have humans walking through. So you have essentially a Petri dish of virus, you know, we won't have a religious talk today, but whether, okay. whatever your theories are, it's theory, right. they want to, theory of evolution, they just want to survive just like humans. Right. So they're constantly looking for new hosts 
to reproduce and hijack the machinery and reproduce and spread and spread. Right. So if you can go from a bat to another animal, to a human, the virus will do it. They'll mutate so they can constantly find new hosts to infect. My question, how yeah. is that transmitted from an animal to a human? Like if you're a cat. Or so it's a great question. Has dro- uh, is it a cold that they sneeze and you get it? Or in this case, so listen, the assumption this, this was. This sounds like a storybook. A bat eats some fruit. Right. Uh, bat guano is on the fruit. The fruit falls down to the ground. An animal comes by and eats that. Now the virus has found a way to enter that animal uh, DNA. And a human comes by and eats that animal. That's a very possibility, right. you know. Or the animal, or the human comes in close contact with this animal. Okay. But we know that as we encroach on natural habitats with other animals, that this is going to happen time and time again. Right. We've seen this with HIV. We've seen this with SARS in 2003, MERS in 2015, and now SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19 in 2019. Okay. So we have three novel coronaviruses, I mean new, four coronaviruses that we see every year that affect Anyone, every year, probably one in three people uh, that get a runny nose, water eyes, cough in the winter, get the coronavirus. So it's very common. Right. But we now have seven specific types that have jumped from the reservoir in nature, probably uh, bats, to humans. Okay. And that's, that's uh, zoology in a nutshell. Why do you think it's so contagious? Like, since we've all been exposed to coronavirus or the common cold, right, right. it seems like if, you know, person A gets in contact with five people, they're all going to get it. Is it... So we haven't been exposed to it? So here's some basic terms. First, we have an outbreak where you're having a spread in a local area. Let's think China. Right. Then it gets a bigger outbreak. That's an epidemic. Then when it starts spreading globally, that's a pandemic, which is essentially what we have. Even though the the names are not so important, the World Health Organization actually calls it something different. Uh, But for all essential purposes, this is a pandemic. Now, people should know, pandemic does not mean how lethal it is. Okay. Right? It just means how infectious it is and the transmissibility. So we clearly see this is very transmissible from person to person. Why is that, right? Well, think about it. We have no vaccine. We've talked about vaccines on our show numerous times right. and how we're such strong proponents and how it's ludicrous when people don't get vaccines. Right. But that's that, we have no vaccine for this. We have no antiretrovirals. So think about the flu and Tamiflu. Right. We don't have any of those drugs. And we have no natural immunity. Right. So we have a vulnerable uh, patient population, human beings, that is, is really ripe for transmission right. because how's it spread? It's spread through contact. I touch you, you touch your face. It's spread through droplets. I cough, I don't cover my mouth. Right. I expel these droplets in the air. They land somewhere, they land your jacket, you go like this, then you go like this, which is why we get to how it, you know uh, we prevent this. It's so, so important with the idea of social distancing, washing your hands, not touching your face, your nose, and your eyes. Right, so social distancing is if you are sick, stay home from work or... Well, social distancing is what I try to do with you also. Right, right, right. I try to stay away from you. We've talked about this. Yeah. And remember, this, this is nothing uh, out of, that we don't tell people to do every winter. Right. If you're sick, stay home. Don't go to school. Don't go to work. Right. Don't be a hero. If you're coughing, sneezing, cover your cover your mouth. But right. in, in general, sneeze into your you know your your elbow. By the way, don't use that same elbow then to to, to elbow bump right. uh, people instead of coughing. So what's instead, the, instead of shaking hands. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's the best way to greet someone now? We'll, we'll get into all that stuff, but you mentioned elbow. I bumping. would say Fit- namaste, like we do in India. Okay, that's cool. just, but that's just my that's just right, my bias. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I had to ask you was the comparisons between influenza and this coronavirus. This is where it gets tricky, right? Because this, uh, I'm coming to you as a doctor on the ground, uh, evaluating this in our own uh, neighborhoods here right. in Northern Jersey. Um, it can be tricky. There's no doubt about it. Right. Most people have the triad, cough, fever, and we say dyspnea, which means shortness of breath. Right. Now we're seeing and we're getting guidance. Again, we're looking at China, really. They had the 80,000 plus cases. Right. So that's the big you know, information that we're getting from of their personal experience. We'll have more experience. And it's also new, so you so don't really know what It's also really new, so we're relying, we're relying on their data. And they, right. I mean, truth be told, they very quickly identified the virus. They right. very quickly sequenced the virus. Right. And they've been publishing very heavy in medical journals. Okay. Uh, so it's actually been, you know, this is... A, I would say, on a side note, an amazing global uh, collaboration. Good. Yeah. Uh, so it's actually fantastic. But now they're having descriptions of people having GI symptoms. What do I mean by GI symptoms? Sure. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. maybe some diarrhea. So guess what? These are nonspecific. That means you could have anything uh, with these types of symptoms. But we have to think about it. We now know that who we think about is different than it was two weeks ago. Okay. It's no longer just travel to China and you have a fever. Right. It's no longer travel to Japan, South Korea, Iran, Italy, places where you are called tier two and tier three travel bans by the CDC. Or a cruise ship. Now it's now it's in our community 
and it's community transmission, spreading from neighbor to friend, right. family members, spouses, etc. Now, this is, again, not to make people um, uh, nervous and scared, just to empower them to know what's happening. Right. So how do we use that information? Now, when we're in the hospital situation, when we're in the ERs, when we're in the medical offices, we're going to evaluate a little closer, you know. Could these symptoms be truly uh, a coronavirus? Let's take a step back. Let's remember that there's plenty of viruses floating around. Right. There's plenty of influenza, other viruses, human metanumavirus. You can have a, one of the other four coronaviruses that we see every year. Right. So even today, we had patients who had coronavirus. And when you tell them, you have to be really specific and say, You don't have the You don't have the coronavirus. Right. You don't have the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, which most people know about as the description of the clinical syndrome. You have one of the coronaviruses that have been floating around. We call community-acquired coronavirus. You have one of the ones that have always been around right. uh, since the 1960s when they're first described. So these symptoms are not specific, but obviously we are really kind of, we're widening our net and who we're looking for because we want to do our best right. to contain. What does contain mean? Contain means you find someone who has the confirmed case, you contact trace, you trace the contacts, first degree, second degree, third degree. Right. That's becoming harder and harder to do, honestly. Right. So we're moving away from containment to mitigation. Mitigation is where we talk about things like social distancing. Okay. You know, CDC is now having some very um, uh, uh, strict guidance for those over 60. You may want to avoid, and I, w- and I would echo that. I'm going right. to go ahead and say it. I would echo that, avoiding large crowds, public gatherings, okay. over 60. Those that are increased risk for, and we'll talk about who those people are, increased risk for more or worse outcomes. Okay. So taken very basically, over 60, you're a longtime smoker, you have lung disease. Right. Asthma you have or asthma COPD, or COPD, emphysema, emphysema right. or even, let's say, sarcoid. Any host of chronic lung disease, which is not uncommon. Uh, you are on medications that depress your immune system. Right. So you might have lupus. You might have rheumatoid arthritis. You transplant patient. Transplant patient, anti-rejection. You might be um, a chemotherapeutic patient. These are things that you have to understand that, hey, there is a chance, albeit small, but there is a chance that it exists that you, one could have a more severe outcome. Right. And those are the ones that we're recommending right now. Certainly consider, you know, if you have concert tickets, et cetera, those are the ones you might want to avoid right. large crowds, public gatherings, et cetera. It appears that the people who have unfortunately died have been, you know, either elderly or really young or had some other comorbidities. I think it's a perfect time to talk about what we say the case fatality is what freaks everyone out. So originally somewhere between 2 and 3%. Okay. Influenza about 0.1%. So we're talking, if you just look at those numbers, Number of people who die, the numerator, number of cases, that's a very simplified way of calculating. Right. Um, between 2 and 3%. And so about 20 times more okay. uh, deadly than the flu. But let's realize, and I think it's well known to everyone out there, that we had some trouble in the beginning from testing who we want to test. Right. Now that's but ramping that, up. That's ramping up now. And that number is also skewed too, right? There's way more people with flu. So obviously... The well, there's two things. One is... I think we're going to find out later that more and more people have this COVID-19. So that denominator is going to grow. Right, okay. And that numerator is not going to grow at the same rate as the denominator. So the percentage fatality will decrease. What we call case fatality, I don't know one wants to, you know, hear these kind of words, but that's going to actually, we expect to drop. Okay. Um, But because this seems to be so highly transmissible, we do expect that denominator to be very large. So even the case fatality rate drops, we do know that even a, if you take it elementary, a very small number of a very big number very small percentage of a very big number still equates to something number, significant yeah. and something tragic and something that we want to prevent. And that's why we have to focus on these high-risk groups, right? Right. Smokers, underlying lung disease, heart disease, poorly controlled diabetes, or those with Im- depressed immune systems, immunosuppressed states. Right. Well, walk us through the process of, say, someone has symptoms, they go right. to the emergency room. There's not like a, a Oh, yes. No, let's, let's stop right there. So, as someone who just came from an emergency room in this area, I can tell you it can be overwhelming right now what's right. happening. For most people, 8 out of 10, 80% will either be asymptomatic or right. have very mild disease. I'm talking about the sick people. Right. Though. So right. we want not everyone with a little sniffles and right. a little, of course. Uh, and I of rode course. the subway yesterday, should go run to the ER. We right. absolutely, last thing we want. Right. You should isolate at home, especially if you're febrile. Call your primary care physician. Right. Let them know. And let them know. And then again, we're ramping up the ability to test and i'm talking you know this is something that's happening in real time we're right. talking it's different today than it was on friday right. we now have commercial testing okay to augment the somewhat lapse that we had at the state and federal level so we now have uh, expanded testing we'll be able to test much more readily right 
but someone who has very mild symptoms can certainly check in with their primary care physician, right. even check in with the ER. We are using, trying to utilize more telemedicine, which is really a big wave of the future, right. to reach people at home, even having visiting nurses come sure. in, do testing as needed. But the last thing we want is people just coming into the ER, getting right. overwhelmed, and also putting themselves at risk uh, with other people who are much more of sick. Course. And also taking time and resources away. Now, I know people say, look, I don't care about other people, I care about myself. Right. So then look at it the other way. You can, you know, hospitals are not always the best place to go. Of course. Uh, when you have a lot of sick people in well, close proximity. Sick people in the hospital. We, you know, we take our infection prevention um, standards and our practices, you know, of utmost serious, seriousness. But just going to the ER if you're otherwise completely right. So we don't promote just going to the ER. But say someone's very sick and. So what is what, very what's sick? The, what's, mean? The, what's the process? So they high fever, shortness of breath. And really the difficulty breathing. Right. Um, those are people you should call ahead. If right. you call your your primary care and say, hey, go to the ER, right. the primary care should know to call ahead. Okay. When you come in to what we call triage, or even before triage, triage right. is like where a nurse figures out who's sure. most sick, who's less right. sick, you are quickly identified as someone who is of a concern. Okay. Not a person under investigation, but just someone who's a concern. Right. right. A mask is placed on you, and you're placed in a separate area of the ER, uh, emergency room, Isolation. away from other, pla- other, other patients. So then a physician like myself, a nurse, infection prevention specialist, can screen you. Okay. And they might say, hey, look at your leg. You have a bad cellulitis. Right. Oh, okay, you, it hurts when you pee and you just had a prostate biopsy. You have a urinary tract infection. Right. This is not what this right. is. But if you listen to the lungs and you find, hey, there might be some pneumonia, then that's someone you would at least investigate further. So what's the screening process? Walk us through that. So someone, say I show up in the ER. So we know. We're, we're, we're say gonna, someone shows up in the ER. Right. So I'm going to assess, fever, your, I'm gonna assess your vital signs. Right. You know, are you having difficulty breathing? What's your respiratory rate? What's your heart rate? Your oxygen level. Right, oxygen level, exactly. So all that. Let's say you're stable. We're going to do an x-ray. We call it portable x-ray. If we see a, we call low bar infiltrate on one side, we might say, hey, you might have a community-acquired pneumonia right, or just whatever. Right, regular pneumonia. What we find on imaging of the chest with COVID-19 is we call ground glass infiltrates. Okay. That's like diffuse and almost looks like ground glass, like ground up glass in all parts of the lung. That starts to make it a little bit more suspicious. Someone, right. you know, who was having fever, who's having new onset of cough, who's having some difficulty breathing, or not, but has these new infiltrates. Okay. Or again, we still ask about travel history. If right. they came back from uh, abroad, right. you of raise course. your level. Yes. If you had contact with a case or suspected case or a person under investigation, it broadens your level. But again, now we know as we have this community spread that those things are less important. Right. And you're checking, sure, for flu and other respiratory so, bacteria viruses. I'm going to jab something up your nose. Okay. Okay, not my finger. Okay. We're going to jab up a swab. Thanks. And what we can do now, uh, we call it different names by the name of the company, but it's a rapid molecular test, rapid diagnostic molecular test. Okay. And that can test a whole host of bacteria and viruses, like 20, right. within a very quick amount of time. And like just today, someone came in very worried, and I was able to give them the results. No, you have a much more common... Okay. Non-novel. What's the turnover time for? It was about two hours. Two hours. These are molecular tests. It's okay. called a PCR, polymerase chain reaction. I know there's a lot of big words I'm throwing at you, but it's important to you know people understand there are there is a process in place. Okay. Good. Now, if someone has those symptoms, that test comes back negative. There's no obvious source of fever. That's where we think, hey, this might be Something a PUI person on. under investigation. Got it. And we're gonna say, look, we're gonna monitor you closely. We're gonna do some more testing. Now, the testing that we can do now for the COVID-19 is the same type of uh, swab up the nose. Right. You actually swab pretty far up the nose. Nasal pharyngeal Nasal swab. pharyngeal, right. It's so it goes the up most the nose uncomfortable the back. thing I've ever had done to but me. But it's like a one second, both noses, and then you're done. It's terrible. It's, it's terrible? You ever, you ever had it done? I have not, actually. The Q-tip goes all, I mean... It, it goes high up, right, and, and right. it's not... We, we do that for flu, too. So we do it for flu. People have had it. It's, it's a 0. 0.5 second of uncomfortableness. It's fine. So now... Before, we didn't really have the great capability to test, and that's, okay. that's something that has been talked about. And again, we're talking about today. And even criticized. And but, criticized, right. but you know, things like I said, this is something that what I say today could change tomorrow and the next day, but this is current as of today. Um, the testing, last week you asked me, we're having a big problem. We're now ramping up our ability to test, which is a fantastic thing. Now, where do we test? Some people may realize or may have heard in South Korea, they almost like a drive through test. Because if you think about it, if you have a bunch of sick people in a closed space like an ER, right. not helpful. Yeah. Great, great way of just spreading germs from person yeah. to person. Today was actually a warm day. What if we had a tent or a drive through area where you, you don't have to get out of your car? Right. You pull up, someone's wearing a mask, they're all they're appropriately uh, covered. You roll down your window, swab your nose, 
you get a little slip, a little piece of number, we'll call you. Okay. That's what we're hoping to get through. That's Something so along those lines. Right. Um, so, now, if you're going to ask, you know, are you going to get fries or a coffee with that? The answer is no. No, no. no. This is strictly supersizing. No. <laughs> supersizing to a different type of test. Right. No, this is strictly COVID-19 testing. I feel like we had to have a joke. This is a very serious conversation. And to be honest, I'm not used. I'm not used to talking so seriously to you. All it's time. hard to listen to. I mean, you, this is great information, but I'm waiting for a joke every. You're waiting for a joke. I think I, this is, you know, the people have been asking for all this information. Well, you, it, let's take a step back. This is probably the first um, pandemic, epidemic, whatever you want to call it. Names not important in the social media age. Right. And as hard as it is to believe, you can't believe everything you read on Instagram or Twitter. Right. It's yes. hard to believe. So. I think it's of utmost importance. Wherever you get your news, make sure it's vetted. And you know, every professional society, whether it's the Journal of American Medical Association, New England Journal of Medicine, Infectious Disease Society of America, they're all trying to get the 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 uh, point across via podcasts like right. ours, uh, Instagram, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, right. tweets, because we know that's how a majority of people, a significant percent of people, get their news. So I just encourage people out there to just always vet their sources. There's a lot of uh, memes going around right. of. Just nonsense that right. you know someone's uh, cousin's uncle's brother is in down on the on the ground in Italy, and it's like the zombie apocalypse, right? right? right, right. We have to really, and I encourage people uh, to really take stock of where they're getting their information right. from. And you know, two weeks ago, everyone on, on social media was a uh, political pundit. Right now, apparently, people have just you can skip the fellowship, and now everyone's an ID specialist. Right. How did that happen? I don't know. I had to end up doing a fellowship. Take Even a some years, people so. in the in the government, or, you know, you just skip <laughs> over right. the uh, just skip right the, over, over skip the smarter right. people. But but the, I I think that we got to hit that point home. Right. So that. besides this podcast, what are what are some good places that people can get information about? You know, and the CDC is a good. Uh, so site. the CDC is who we look for guidance at the federal level. Okay. Um, anything Anthony Fauci says, like, I'm okay. gonna come and say it. He is the top. This is Dr. ID. Fauci. Yeah, yes. Dr. Fauci. Anything he says, uh, he's a top infectious disease doctor in the, in the land. Right. Uh, you know, coming from the National Institutes of Allergies and Infectious Disease. Anything coming from the CDC, the World the Health NIH. Organization. World Health, of course, but I think you know that's a global situation. Right, right. I I like the CDC, and of course, we we filter down to our state levels, sure. New Jersey Department of Health. There's actually a if you go to the website, a 24/7. Uh, hotline you can call that's free, it's okay. open, staffed, and people in multiple languages. And then the local level. So if we're talking about our own institution, holynamemedicalcenter.org, uh, there is a blog that I put on there. There's a YouTube um, uh, call-in that myself and the chief medical officer did. And the idea of doing this is not to just be on TV or be on media. This is a way of just, we need to disseminate that information. proper yes. information because people are going to constantly say, what do I do? What, who do I call? Where do I go? Should I just go to the ER? Right. And we need to let people know that there's a very specific process in place that there is constantly being fine-tuned. And at the end of the day, some people say, Orange, isn't this chicken little? You're, you're running around with your head, you know, and right. the world's going to end. I will have no problem saying it's better to be... Safe than sorry. Uh, well, you know, overreact. Than, and, and six months from now, hey, maybe we overreacted or maybe we, you know, prepared. You can never prepare too much. Overreact. But I never want to say we underreact. So speaking of overreaction, do you think something yeah. that Italy did was something that will happen here or... I, I have, I've been saying for several weeks, this is something Just that's echoing the CDC, that, uh, that, that they have, you know, um, slowly kind of put out there for people's, you know, in their ear to listen, to have an idea that we are past the uh, time of containment where you can just isolate someone and there are three contacts. Right. Because we know this is widespread in the community. How widespread, we don't know because we haven't, we had a lag in testing. We go from containment to mitigation. A big part of mitigation is social distancing and even home quarantine. So right. I know in our town, um, you know, there's some things going in place about for children to be able to distance learn, right. Google Classroom, whatever it might right. be. I know uh, a lot of major trade shows, trade uh, meetings, medical meetings are all been canceled. Right. We know a lot of people that can have the ability to work from home through technology are now being urged to do so or being recommended to do so or at least being um, uh, uh, approved to do so if there's concerns. Of course, someone like me and you in the medical community, it doesn't exist. Right. You know, we, ha we are in the front lines. Uh, so that's why as healthcare providers, and I'm not talking doctors, only nurses, uh, medics, PAs, MPs. Anyone working in the hospital or you know, with, it's, with it, you know, sick people. We're doing a lot of training for donning, that is putting on, doffing, taking off. We call PPE, protective, uh, personal protective equipment. This becomes really important. Right. Not just washing your hands, putting on a gown. There's an order. You put a gown on when you go in a room, then you put a mask on. 
Then you put goggles on. Then you put um, then you put uh, gloves on. Okay. And even when you come out of a room, it's the whole process we do to take off this stuff. So the reason I'm telling you this is that people should feel those empowered. Are, that's important. But those are people in the hospital. How how should everyday people protect? Oh, so what about these masks we see? Right. Do you know there have been studies now coming out. If you are sick, if you if someone's commuting and they have a common cold, little runny nose, otherwise feel fine, little fever, a they should probably be at home. Right. But if they're not, maybe they just have a little bit of runny nose, otherwise feel fine. Wearing a mask to protect other people, fully, uh, fully down with it. Okay. Fully com- wearing a mask because you want to protect yourself against other people gives you a false, false sense of security, and that's okay. really important for people to understand. Wearing a mask and then you know I just touch my face, but my hands are clean. But then forgetting I have a mask on. Okay, let me touch my face. Let me touch my eyes. Let me rub my nose. Let me, uh, you know, my nose itches. Let me touch my nose. Let me rub my eyes. It's giving you a false sense of security. There have actually been studies out there and and data suggests that the mask, all it does is just breed warm, humid air where other bacteria and viruses can breed. Okay. If someone is coughing or sneezing and they have happen to have COVID-19 by you, it lands in your face, it's not going to protect you because this is the mask that we don't necessarily use. This is a surgical mask. We use something called a respirator, or N95. Right. It's a much different type of mask. Not the typical surgical mask you see people walking around. So there's no data, there's no evidence to suggest wearing a mask is helpful. I think it's very important for people to understand that. And in fact, all you're doing is taking away uh, protective equipment for people in the front we'll lines. Them, yes. You're giving yourself a false sense of security. And, you know, you've seen it. People wear a mask and then they'll rub their eyes. They'll rub underneath the mask. They'll rub their itch nose. There's a meme about all the people announcing, like the people in, you know, in the government announcing or talking. And then they're, you see them rubbing their face and touching. Do you know the average person touches their face several times a minute? It is very hard. And I'm guilty of it. You know, if I'm intently studying, reading, whatever, I notice I kind of, you know, do something. So we know... We can easily to say here, hey, don't ever touch your face. That's not the reality. It's hard. Right. Uh, I have a tickle on my nose right now, so I'm going to go like this. See? That's sexy. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, what about hand sanitizer? Which, which is hand washing. So how should you wash your hands? You're at home. Soap and water is fine. I would say sing happy birthday twice or do the alphabet. Okay. That's about the amount of time. If you're out and about, you know, a alcohol-based sanitizer with about 60% alcohol, still rubbing for a vigorous amount until your hands are dry. Okay. So just don't slap it on and walk around. Right. You want to keep rubbing it. And again, it takes about 15, 20 seconds also until your hands are dry. That's the way to go. Okay. Now, I know that people are saying there's runs on, uh, there's a scarcity of all these things. But again, wash your hands with good old-fashioned soap. Water does work. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So say someone, unfortunately, contracts us. What's the treatment? All right. So that's a great question. It really depends on what their symptoms are. 80%, again, I'll repay it, 80% of people will have no symptoms or very mild symptoms. In fact, so mild that they might not even see the doctor. Right. For all you know, you and I have had it and have recovered. We just don't know. Right. Now, 20%, those 20% will have moderate to severe disease. And it's really that 3 to 5% of severe disease, again, heavily weighted in the elderly, smokers, underlying lung disease, right. diabetes, so a heart disease. certain demographic right. will have mo- Those are the ones disease. who could progress, unfortunately, to respiratory failure. That means they need to be intubated. They need a lot of oxygen. Or maybe they won't be intubated, but they need oxygen through their nose they need something called bipap or a mask or uh, what have you a venti mask yes. whatever it might be right high flow oxygenation um now it's a bell-shaped curve we're always gonna have outliers medicine sure. is never uh black and white there's always a gray zone but if we look overall in general those 35 and younger that are healthy that are healthy uh don't seem to have much manifestation of disease and much severe disease why is that it's unclear we do know that this virus uses an enz- a, a, um, enzyme called ACE2, which is found in the lung. So it's basically a protein to kind of hijack it and use that as an entryway into the body. So that's why we say this has an infinity or predilection uh, 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 for the lungs itself. and okay. causing. That's why it causes more lung issues than other and issues. Anything else, yes. Now, why do you have some of these GI issues beforehand? It's not clear. Uh, why do some people develop these very severe diseases? Severe manifestations, so we call cytokine storm. So, and some people get in, 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 induce a very severe reaction. Think dominoes. Once you just have one down, they all start falling everywhere. Right. We call that cytokine storm. There's some data being looked at this thing called interleukin six, and can you block that? And that will make people better. There's a lot of great signs coming extremely quickly. Right. Considering this was just des- just described in December of 2019, we have uh, a clinical trial at University of Nebraska Medical Center of a drug that was looked at, Ebola. You remember Ebola yep. from 2015? This drug did, was not, unfortunately, uh, had activity against that. 
That was actually 2014. But in 2015, it was shown to have efficacy, activity against MERS in monkeys. So, and in the test tube. So in vitro and in vivo. There's now first uh, clinical trials being uh, utilized for that. We're hoping to expand that nationwide. There's a vaccine that's being looked at by a company called Moderna, but that's 12 to 18 months away. So right. it certainly the not whole process with the even FDA. if they fast track it 12 to 18 months. Wow. So not ready for this winter. And to be f- frank, if this virus becomes endemic, endemic means it starts repeating itself. It doesn't just go away. So the one thing is, will it go away in the summer months, which we don't know. That's and another the question. Other, is it? The other thing is, will it come back? If it comes back and back to the next winter, we do, you know, a vaccine still won't be ready. So it's going to be at least probably till sometime in 2021. Right. That, that, that's going to come back. Um, another thing people say is 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 it's seasonal. So you know how there's flu season between that's right, October that's right. and or September and and March. Is this everyone's saying once the war, weather warms up, this will so so die down. So let's take it back. Why is it when it's warm that viruses, a lot of viruses, go away? Well, when I cough and sneeze in cold air, that's very low humidity. Okay, it stays suspended, floating around the Got air it. for a long period of time. When the air is humid, so it's heavy, it's warmer, it falls to the ground, so less chance of right. it spreading. Also, obviously, in the cold weather, uh, people are cohorted together. They're indoors. Sure, sure. They're hanging out, right? When it's warm, people uh, are outside. Like, what do you do when it's cold outside? You just... I'm in the house. You're in the house. Yes. Just Netflix and chilling family. the whole Netflix, thing. yes. But imagine people tend to congregate in close... Of course. Parties are inside. They're not outside. You're not having a pool party. You're having a house party with right. a bunch of people so inside. So there's nothing magical about the no, but, the virus itself. Well, it's, it's just the, air, the situation. It's the air in terms of how the particles spread. It's the close proximity of people sure. in the cold. And then some people surmise that as the uh, spring and summer and the sun tilts towards the earth, you have better UV light or, or stronger UV light. Okay. So that the viruses are less able to um, survive on surfaces and things like that. They're, essentially, they're destroyed by light. So we don't know. That's what everyone asks. Doc, won't this go away when it gets warmer outside? Right. We hope. I sure hope. Yes. Will it go away when it, when it gets warmer? Will it just simply shift to the southern hemisphere? Which yes, it's less populated, but we live in a global economy, so global world. So you're always, you know, playing right, right away, right, 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 from Africa, from uh, uh, you know, sub equatorial Africa, South America, Australia, sure. what have you. And even if it goes away, will it just come back? We do know that there's some other coronaviruses that kind of exist throughout the year, so it's not a given that this will be seasonal, right? And by no means a given that this is a one and done thing. We have seen the virus uh, sequenced in California. It's already about 6% different than the virus in China, where we assume it originated. So what does that mean? Wow. The virus, as it mutates, just like in human DNA, you get these errors of mutation, of, of replication. So as it's reproducing, you just get natural errors in there. So now it's already about 6% different than China. Now, the thing is, viruses don't want to kill their host. Okay, I know we don't use these kind of words, but their idea... To have the host uh, alive so they host, can replicate. Right. Yeah. So some, a lot of times when viruses will mutate, they actually become less hardy. They actually become weaker. Opposite could be true. That's, I know I'm giving you a lot of that's unknowns. That's reassuring. But yeah. these are things that we as doctors and, you know, doctor scientists and public health officials, this is what we're looking at. Right. So... Uh, and people are a lot smarter than me. I'm talking virologists, other people. Uh, I didn't think there was anyone more smarter than you. No, it's just besides, not. It's just the good looking part. Yeah. Besides myself. Yes. Um, what about uh, <laughs> people asking if it's safe to travel... Do you, you recommend that? It's a difficult question. Um, and I'll give a difficult answer. CDC is now recommending no cruise travel. Uh, Definitely no Americans, cruise, obviously. All right? So um, at least for now. Right. Um, you know, the, the, the party line keeps changing on travel. I, I cannot say with good faith that there's no risk traveling. Before we would say, okay, as long as I don't go to China, I don't go to South Korea, I don't go to Japan, Italy, I'm right. fine. But we know that these things spread. There can be a lag from when it's when pe- it's in the community and when it actually becomes known because there's a incubation period right. of up to two weeks. Right. You have to ramp up the testing. So I don't. I think people need to constantly reevaluate. Right. And I know that's not pleasing for people. Spring break's coming up. Sure. People, hey, am I going? Am I not going? Right. I would say you have to constantly be vigilant and assess the situation. You know, we know that certain employers may may require uh, recommended furloughs. I'm talking on a very general basis sure. here. So people have to keep these things in mind. Um, you know, full disclosure, I'm supposed to go to Iceland in April. And my, my answer is, I just don't know. It's a wait and see approach. Um, I know people like to ask doc, what is the answer? Is it A or is it B? Right. And this is definitely a a C. It's definitely a C. Yeah. Yeah, This is kind of uncharted territory. Wow. Do you have any, you know, summary recommendations for people who are scared or nervous? One is you never want to be panicking. You run fast. You don't run scared. Right. Uh, you hope for the best, you prepare for the worst. That's what we're doing here. Um, 
anytime people get anxiety about this, 80% of the time, 80% of the time is a large percentage of the time, people are going to be just fine, have no symptoms or very mild symptoms. Doesn't mean that 20% of people are going to have severe symptoms. You're going to have moderate to severe, which means you might require some hospitalization. You might require oxygen for a couple of days. Right. Uh, we've heard reports of people who went to the hospital, a couple of days required oxygen, no problem. Now we're getting smaller numbers, 3 to 5%. Right. Those are the ones that are concerning. Those are the ones that may require prolonged stays in the hospital, stays in the ICU, and more advanced uh, means of giving oxygen. So we have to present the data as we know it. Uh, we have to understand that this is a fluid uh, uh, a situation that right. is constantly changing. We know that people can be empowered by, again, social distancing, washing your hands often, not touching your mouth, your face, your eyes. If you are particular risk groups that we described, highly consider avoiding um, large gatherings of people. Sure, yeah. And, you know, I think people should prepare now uh, for their children being at home, uh, so then, you know, have their daycare situation set up, um, having some essentials, like especially for the elderly so they don't have to go to the pharmacy, have stock some groceries checked out, stock on food, things yes. like that. This is potential for something that's unprecedented in the United States, which would, be, which would be mass home isolation. We're already telling people for the sick, stay home. Right. This is now we're talking about people that are healthy, staying home for prolonged periods of time. Again, it's, I acknowledge it, many people have acknowledged it, that this is something unprecedented, but this is something we have to prepare for now. Uh, so that, fine, you have a little staycation at home, you're comfortable at home, and many people can work from home. Right. Just, you know, and I mentioned doctors and, and those at the forefront uh, having to go in, but we are trying to utilize things like telemedicine, other things. Sure. It, mostly, again, our, our job is and our our focus is always uh, to protect our patients. So instead of having a patient coming to our doctor's office, maybe we can use Skype, we can use uh, something called CareCloud, other type of third-party apps just a regular that, that are... Um, what we call compliant, HIPAA compliant, that I'll enable a doctor and a and a patient to communicate. And if someone has very mild symptoms, hello, Mr. X, Mrs. S, how are you doing? You're feeling fine. You have a temperature, but you're checking in. You're watching TV. You're doing okay. Stay right. home. And then you know we assess on a daily basis. We check in. How they doing? That's yeah. really a big part of this, and that's something that I think we're going to see more and more. Not just for this situation, but in general, medicine. Telemedicine is a very powerful tool. Wow. We should do a whole different episode on telemedicine later. We should, yeah. um, but we wanted to thank you for coming. Hey, it's my pleasure. This is actually your job, so you're supposed to be here. But um, if you like this video, please subscribe. Where can people find you? Where can they find us? I was you want to do rapid fire questions? No? All right, you, no, no. no, not today. All right, no. You can do one non-COVID-19 uh, question. If you like. <laughs>